Hey guys, Demoman here with another video. That's right, today we're going to be taking a look at ground vehicles, going to be breaking them down, very keep it nice and simple, and we're going to try and cover all of them in this one video. Also, on the side from this, uh, next video I'm planning on making is the ground warfare video, where we'll be discussing like, you know, more of the troops and, like, other sides of, like, you know, that kind of side of things, such as vehicles interacting with troops and things like that, and what kind of stuff you'd want to equip yourself with, and, like, maybe if you had a squad of guys, what they'd be equipped with, and how they could handle ground vehicles and that type of stuff. So, yeah, right now we're just going to break down the basics and the uses of each one of these vehicles. So, sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy the ride. So first on the chopping board is, of course, the Origin X1 series of bikes. Now you might be wondering, oh, um, I'm new to Star System. What is a jet bike or what are these X1 bikes? Well, these X1 bikes are basically a type of mobility, like, well, a vehicle. It's basically, it says in the tin, it's a jet bike, like the ones in Star Wars, like the speeders. But, um, yeah, a lot more detailed and advanced. So yeah, the X1 bikes are basically the top, top of the line um, for human manufacturing. I have to specify on that because there is an alien manufacturer for one of them. So yeah, the X1 bikes are really cool. So first off, let's cover what they say on the X1 base. So X1 base is obviously designed for touring. It's designed to basically be your bike that you maybe take with you on your 890 or your 600i and you can take this out with you and you go riding around and then you come back after maybe exploring the beach or whatever. So yeah, welcome to the next level of the X1 Origin Jumpworks new high performance open canopy vehicle. Built from lightweight polymers, the X1 takes speed and agility to the next level thanks to a seamlessly integrated engine technology and joint vector thruster placement. Innovative design and high quality engineering weave together to create a flight experience like no other. So that's what they uh, say about the bike. So let's have a look here. So you've got a length of around 5.50 meters. You've got a beam of 1.30 meters and a height of 1.50 meters. It's classed as a snub. Obviously, it's a bike. Now, a lot of the stats on this, uh, on this vehicle are in development. But what I can guarantee you is it only holds one person, and that is it. This one has zero cargo capacity like the rest of the X1 bike series. They have no cargo, and that's important to note. So radar is a vehicle class radar, the same as the other two bikes here on this list. It has a vehicle class computer, same as the other two um, X1 bikes, that is. So for propulsion, it has got uh, fuel intakes, it's got one vehicle fuel intake, same as the others, and one vehicle class fuel tank, same as the others. It doesn't have a quantum or a jump or a quantum fuel tank or any of that stuff, it doesn't have any of those. It's got one main thruster and 16 fixed maneuvering thrusters like the others. So now we're going to systems and it has obviously got vehicle power plant and vehicle cooler and a vehicle shield generator. Now that is like one of the other bikes but there's another bike that has two of those, but we'll get into that in a moment. So weaponry, you have one M3A laser cannon, so it's a size one weapon you have on this thing. It's not designed for a combat. I mean, let's be honest, it's a it's a damn jet bike, you know? <laughs> it's not something you're gonna go, right, let's go. We're gonna take on this uh, Polaris that's bearing down on our house. Let me get on the bike. I'll be back. <laughs> Smoke me a kipper. I'll be back for breakfast. <laughs> Jump on the jet bike and ride up there. That ain't gonna work. It, it's gonna end very, very badly. But, um, but yeah, it's more for personal defense, because what you also need to remember, guys, is there will be dangerous wildlife on some of these planets that you visit and whatnot. And if you're touring, especially, now this is for you guys out there who own 890 jumps and 600 eyes, and you plan on using the ships for the desired roles, so actual touring and whatnot, maybe if you go down to a lush jungle planet, or maybe somewhere that... Not many people have been to before. It's just been discovered or whatever, and you want to be one of the first people to go down there and really ex like have a exploration, like a real sort of touring event. Well, that's why you have a gun because you might be going around, and the explorers who charred the planet might not have had enough time to catalog everything. And all of a sudden, you bump into something the size of like I don't know a double-decker bus or a Greyhound. 
bus, basically, and it wants to eat you. That's why you have a size 1 laser cannon. Or it's just to hold off raiders and these types of things, all that sort of stuff. All the unnecessary stuff you don't really want to deal with if you're a uh, Origin, uh, you know, 600i or 890 owner. You know, you don't want to deal with a riffraff. Just shoot him in the face. <laughs> So the, uh, the next one on the list here is the X1 Velocity. Now this is the racing variant. So for all of you racers out there who absolutely love racing, this is the one for you. Now let's see what they say on it. How do you make fast go faster? Origin Jumpworks X1 Velocity dares you to push the boundaries of speed by stripping down the base X1 to its core elements. Eliminating the weapon mount, incorporating a new Cytec composites to create a lighter chassis for overall weight loss. This one has been on an Atkins. It's around, well, is it? Yeah, it's 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 around like a few kg uh, lighter than the others. It's not too much, but it has no weapons. Same stats otherwise as the other one, just a little lighter. But yeah, this is a racing bike basically. This is not something you're gonna be taking much damage with hell this is something you don't want to bump into stuff with like the other two also like this this bike is designed strictly for racing and i'm really looking forward to seeing racing on the uh the spectrum screen when maybe on a long haul journey flying from a to b you turn on one your monitors on your ship and you watch maybe a race or something it'd be cool to watch these bikes go around a track that'd be pretty badass it'd be a, a real spectacle you could say so, the last on the list, but definitely not least, this one has got tiger eyes. This one's the meanest of the bunch. The X1 Force. The Pathfinder. Built to endure tougher environments and look good doing it, the X1 Force is a modified version of the base X1 model, featuring additional defensive elements to toughen up this speedy and agile open canopy bike, allowing it to serve in a variety of roles from exploring worlds to potential security infiltration ops. So the one difference this bike does have on the others is the fact it actually has an additional shield generator and it comes with one CF117 Bulldog laser repeater as standard. So now at the end of the day though, I'm just gonna cut it to you straight. These origin bikes are not designed to take punishment, okay? They're not designed to take the, the hits like maybe some of the other vehicles on this list here. Do not think you can just have a bunch of X1 forces as your main stead of uh, ground combat vehicles because it will end very badly. Um, fantastic though for scouting and infiltration. I'd have to say the X1 force is the best vehicle on this entire list um, for single person scouting operations that have a small footprint and are able to get out of dangerous terrain quickly. And the reason I say that is because yes, the X1 series of bikes are designed to go fast along flat terrain, but when it comes down to it, it's still a jet bike. You might skim the ground a couple of times and take a little bit of damage, but at least you can get out of trouble, unlike a wheeled vehicle that might not be able to climb a certain ledge or it might fall into a crevasse or something. This bike gives you the opportunity to literally jump the shark. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's the X1 series of bikes. They're pretty unique, and I do like them a lot. Um, personally, so the X1 base, as I covered, is for touring. X1 Velocity is for racing, and the X1 Force is the Pathfinder combat variant. Now, the positives and drawbacks. Positives to these bikes is they all come with the best grade components you can get from Origin. So most likely luxury and racing components for these vehicles. Not really much in the way of military stuff. But uh, positives are they're going to they're gonna run smooth. They're going to do exactly what they say on the tin. These are the Rolls Royces of the Star Citizen world in terms of ground vehicles. They are going to be reliable, they're going to be quick, and they're going to be nimble and have a low footprint. Really good for scouting operations. But the drawbacks are they're going to be a pain in the ass to repair. I'm not even kidding. The getting the parts for these is going to be a nightmare. It's going to be super expensive compared to the other ground vehicles, that is, of course. And, yeah, no, but it does come with something that you cannot really buy with the other vehicles, and that is a social status. You can imagine maybe in a town or even a segment of a city where you can use your land vehicles. Imagine parking up outside a, uh, a store or whatever on your X1 base or your X1 velocity or your X1 force. Just parking it up 
outside, let's say, a, a store or something, and you get off your bike to go inside, you're going to have other players that might stop and go, wow, that looks really cool, you know, and stopping and maybe taking a few pictures. That's the kind of draw for these types of vehicles. I mean, let's be honest, you know, there's a lot of eye candy there to look at. I mean, these bikes are absolutely gorgeous. They look so sleek. I mean, it's very cool. So let's move on to the next vehicle in the list. So the next vehicle on the list is the Nox. So obviously those of you out there, a lot of you already own the Nox, and the Nox is goddamn cool. It is literally, in my eyes anyway, the Judge Dread bike. It totally is. And if you know what, uh, you know, Judge Dread is and whatnot, a lot of you do, but I'm finding out more morally lead, some people actually don't, and that's a little disappointing. But if you don't know what Judge Dredd is, look it up. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. But yeah, the um, the comics, not the movies. <laughs> Just gotta specify. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, back back on target here. Um, before I do a Sylvester Stallone impression. So yeah, the Knox. The Knoxes are really, really, really cool. They're really nice bikes. Um, and I'll tell you why from experience. They're pretty sturdy. I mean, compared to the Dragonfly, I found they blow up a lot less, and they're damn quick. They are hard as hell to catch, and they're even harder to shoot at. So, um, yeah, let's jump in and see what the developers say. Let's read the words, the words of the developers. Hit the skids with the 2947 Knox. This speedy, maneuverable, open canopy racer from a poet is capable of zipping along planet surfaces or deep space. Available for the first time in human space, the Nox has been significantly redesigned for human pilots. So grab your ship and head to the racetrack today. So that is for the standard Apoa Nox. Um, now, what you got to bear in mind here is the Nox is, well, the original Nox is designed for those lovely space turtles called the Jean that we know of, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> yeah, except there's an entire species of these bad boys, and they live a lot longer than us. And if you want to know more about that, check out my history videos, where I cover some of the Jean history. So yeah, the, um, the bike is a beast. It is a behemoth. This thing is a monster. Um, so it's around 550 meters in length. It's 150 meters in height and 150 meters in beam. Its class is snub, obviously. It holds one person. And yeah, that's that's basically the base facts on this thing. It has zero cargo capacity, sadly. And um, yeah, that's, that's just the way it is, I guess. It uh, has a vehicle radar, vehicle computer, vehicle fuel intake, and vehicle fuel tank. It has two retro main uh, retro thrusters, one main, 16 fixed maneuvering thrusters, a vehicle radar, a vehicle cooler and a vehicle shield generator so yeah it also has a vehicle power plant it's obvious to get that uh, across um, it also comes with two m3a laser cannons now this is the difference between the uh the nox here and uh, the x1 the nox does come with a little bit more firepower so you do have more stopping power and it's a little bit quicker but yeah, the the Nox is a it's a bit of a beefy bike. It is it's not joking around when it when it rocks out there. But yet again, it's not a dedicated combat vehicle. None of these bikes are really designed for that. The one that fulfills a military s combat role the best, in my honest opinion, would be the X1 Force, simply because it is a recon bike. It can do it better than all the other vehicles here. So yeah, the um. Well, other bikes that is. So yeah, the uh, the bike, the bikes here, these Noxes aren't aren't bad at all. Now, the stats here are completely identical to the other Nox, which is the Nox Q, and they've uh, written a little bit more uh, lore on it here. So let's see what they say. <laughs> Driving its name from the Jean word for thrust, the Nox Q delivers the thrust. More this limited version of the Open Canopy Racer features the stunning brush silver finish and was specifically created to celebrate the inaugural sale of the first Nox for Human Riders. Basically, they painted it white because they want more of us wretched humans to be blasted to smithereens because with a bright white vehicle, there's nowhere to hide in space. <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, the Noxes are pretty cool. They come in one or two colors. 
same as the dragonflies, which we'll move on to next here, right after I've told you the positives and negatives of owning a Nox. So, redesigned for humans does not mean it's going to be as easy to fix as maybe a dragonfly. Now, that's another drawback here. The Nox does come with Jean technology components. Some of these parts may be harder to source than, let's say, standard issue human parts, which may make them even more expensive, and even worse, you might not be able to find a replacement part for your bike if you take damage. So when you park it on board your ship and you're like, well, I'm going to get this fixed before I take it out again, that might be a very long time, unlike the uh, Dragonfly, which you'll be able to basically just go, oh, okay, I'm going to go down to maybe whatever planet here and snap a couple of bits off of that and put them on my bike, and there you go, it's running again. But yeah, the, uh, <laughs> the Nox is a pretty interesting vehicle though nonetheless it does have that shock and awe factor but it does have decent weaponry it's fast as well so if you want to get somewhere quick along a planet's surface the Nox is for you so let's move on to the next vehicle here that we've got in our lineup so the next vehicle here in our lineup is obviously the dragonfly the biggest of the bikes uh, length of six meters beam of 2.50 meters and a height of 1.50 meters. Its class is snub. It carries one SCU of cargo, unlike the others, but there's a reason for that I'll get to in a moment. It has a vehicle class radar, and it has a vehicle class computer. Now, it says small for the Dragonfly Yellow Jacket, but I'm not sure if that is on purpose or it was a typo, but it may have a small class computer but that wouldn't make much sense I mean you don't really need the computing power on a bike but yeah they both have fuel uh, vehicle fuel intakes and vehicle fuel tanks they have two retro thrusters one main and eight gimbaled maneuvering thrusters they both have vehicle radars they have vehicle uh, coolers and vehicle shield generators and they also have two M 3A laser cannons as well these bikes now I know in the game right now they're equipped with shotguns and that is super badass but unfortunately <laughs> it's not what it says here on the ship matrix but as we know the ship matrix is just evil and it must be rewritten at least more than once a month I mean come on people but yeah the um blurb here on the yellow jacket we'll start with the Drake Dragonfly is the perfect snub ship for anyone looking to live on the edge, with nothing sparing the pilot from the dangers of space. <laughs> oh boy, yep. The Dragonfly is as much an adventure as a ship. Dual mode conversion allows the Dragonfly to operate on the ground or in space, and rear-facing second seat means you can take one more passenger. This exclusive Yellow Jacket version is available only for the concept sale. Now that is the concept version. Now the, the Drake Dragonfly uh, Black is exactly the same in what it's written, except it says this black model is Drake's standard production version. That's the two difference. So it usually comes in black, but if you want to be fancy, you'd have to get the uh, Yellow Jacket. Now I know they sell bundles with the Yellow Jacket, it is such a cool bike, it really is. Personally, the Drake Dragonfly is my favorite bike because it's a space Harley. Hell, it even sounds like it. It has the popping noises and everything. It's really cool. So yeah, the, the Yellow Jacket and the Drake Dragonfly Black. So let's just call it the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly is unique in the fact that it actually has a sort of synergy that goes really, really well with the other Drake lineup. It even has a bay on board a Kraken capital ship specifically designed for it. The Dragonflies are going to be rugged, reliable, easy to maintain, cheap as chips to fix, um, so you can get parts pretty much anywhere, and also you don't have to worry about reputation unlike the other two bikes. The other two bikes may be affected by reputation. I'm guessing that if you screw over the Space Turtles a few too many times, you might not be able to get too many replacement parts for your fancy Space Turtle bike. I know some of you are probably raging at the fact I call it a space turtle bike, but come on, let's be honest here. The John are giant space turtles. <laughs> um, so, the X1, obviously Origin, they have a rule where they, they sell to 
upper echelon individuals. So if you have a really crappy uh, rating on your reputation, you may not be able to get the parts for your bikes. So the Drake Dragonflies. The Dragonflies are hardcore. They're really down to bare bones. They're not as fast as the uh, other two, obviously. They're a little slower. But, however, there is a trade-off. They do better on more unstable terrain. Um, they are better at going over more rocky surfaces and things like that. They are fairly fast for what they are, but more, most importantly is they can hold two people. That changes things dramatically. It turns from a bike to a raiding vehicle that can also hold one SCU of cargo. That is dangerous because if you look at it from another perspective, okay, so your other bikes on this list are generally used for single person A to B and maybe even a scouting operation. These bikes change the game. They go from just standard issue jet bikes to something that you're expecting to see if there's a raid. If you have maybe built up an outpost, you've paid someone that has a pioneer to build your outpost, you've invested all your credits into maybe farming hydrogen or something, or farming god knows what, or you put these things out around your outpost and it'll mine the resources as long as there's resources there. You might put all your funds into building one of these sort of mining outpost bases uh, kind of deals and that'll be your source of income. You just basically run the place and it becomes much more of a game like maybe Ark Survival Evolved or something like that where you live mostly planet side and you have your food and you have all this sort of stuff growing and you're just mining your resources for credits and you're maybe there for a couple of months real time trying to grind up as much money as you can from this resource area before you have enough to maybe buy uh, maybe something bigger or something like that or maybe even expand your operation. Now this is where the yellow jackets and the dragonfly blacks come in to really kick your ass. These bikes are damn quick in comparison to let's say other bigger lumbering behemoth vehicles that are on the ground. Not only that, they are jet bikes, that means they can be launched while the vehicle is still flying above you out of the ramp and not blow up upon hitting the ground as long as they're low enough. They have the space for two. They can hold cargo. Now this is the problem. If they can hold cargo, they can come down, maybe even a swarm of these suckers, and just completely overrun your defenses in no time because there's too many small targets for these automated guns to take on at the same time. As soon as a, one of these automated guns of yours locks onto one bike, another bike will blow it up. So then these bikes come in, they drop off some more raiders, the raiders shoot your NPC guards in the face and maybe a couple of your buddies who just came down to look at your outpost and then you're locked up in a closet somewhere or a storeroom and you're hiding as these guys rummage through all your personals and your your stuff and all your belongings and they put the crates of cargo on their bikes and they shuttle it back to wherever the hell they came from maybe their caterpillar or something and then they zoom off with a whole bunch of free loot and you know they'll definitely be back maybe in a month or maybe in two months but it could become a regular occurrence and that'll become a problem but that is the dragonfly it is a unique and awesome 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 bike I I can't recommend it enough because it also does something else it can be a really smart way of maybe recovering samples if you're doing exploration. You have a, a dragonfly, you have a containment box, you find something, put it in a containment box, put it on the back of your bike, and you zoom out. Unfortunately, it means you're on a bike. <laughs> and we all know how it goes for the people who rode the bikes in Star Wars when they're on Endor. Not too well. Could get attacked by small space teddy bears, and that is never pretty. So yeah, let's move on to the next vehicle in the list here. Okay, so now we're getting serious into the ground vehicles, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the wheeled vehicles. Obviously, we're talking about the Tumbral Cyclones. The Tumbral Cyclones are badass, and they're pretty, uh, pretty hardcore. It's the equivalent of what would happen to a Humvee after it had been maybe in over-engineered to be economically friendly, and then engineered again to work in space. So that's where the Cyclone kind of comes in. So, let's have a look at what they say on the standard issue Cyclone. With a potent combination of speed, maneuverability, and rugged durability, this Cyclone is a perfect choice for local deliveries and transport between planet side and homesteads and outposts. That is true. It is reliable, you can use it to get from A to B, and it should be fairly easy to repair, but unfortunately, yet again, there is another issue. When you have wheels, that presents problems. 
you can maybe lose one of said wheels and your vehicle then becomes immobilized. And it's a lot easier to lose a wheel than a maglev plate or a gravlev plate. Um, sorry, not maglev. Maglev is a completely different technology. <laughs> gravlev. If you lose a gravlev plate, your vehicle's unbalanced and it might wobble, but you'll still be able to function. You lose a wheel and you are stranded. There, are, You can't drag the vehicle from A to B. You're, you're not, like, you know, going to lift it up like, Damn it, Khan! Pick up the car! La, 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 la. <laughs> and just lug it behind you on a chain. It won't work. <laughs> Unless you're Arnie, of course. But, you know, <laughs> most of us aren't Arnie. So its length is 6 meters, its beam is 4 meters, and its height is 2.50 meters. Its size is obviously vehicle. Cargo capacity of one standard cargo unit. You can haul around one crate. That's one crate worth of big bennies that you can ship around. It can hold two people, and it has vehicle class components. The same as the other vehicles on this list that come from the... Uh, Tumbral Cyclone Department. They have all the same components except, well, well, base components except for the specialized variants, which we'll now get into. So now we're going to talk about the Cyclone TR. Now, this one is the one that has the teeth. This is the real nasty one of the bunch. Now, if you've ever played a game called Halo, you'll know of a vehicle called the Warthog, and that's exactly what the Cyclone TR is. Essentially, this thing is a all-terrain mobile gun platform that you can basically quickly wheel into battle. I'd highly recommend it if you were to do ground operations. You'd have a bunch of marines and a couple of these jeeps and you deploy your guys and you send the jeeps on out, out ahead, maybe to scout, preferably to cause chaos. That's the idea. They're fast moving. They've got a real nasty gun on them, a lot of DECA, and yeah, it's, it's pretty useful. So let's read what the developers say on this vehicle. Designed for militia and security use, the Cyclone TR module features upgraded armor and a single human-operated turret capable of mounting a single size 1 weapon at a responsive 360 field of fire. So basically it means your gun can rotate all the way around. You sit in a turret and you can spin it all the way around and light up anybody that gets in your way, which is pretty cool. Now, obviously, these, these vehicles do have shields, which means, uh, you know, you can take a bit of a beating, which is handy, but it's a vehicle shield, which is the same as the bikes, not too sturdy. And to put things into perspective, the X-1 has two vehicle shields, so you can see why I said it was a good military recon vehicle, because these vehicles only mount one vehicle shield. You've got double the shield tanking capability of any of the Tumbrel Cyclones on that X-1 force. So, yeah, um... Let's continue here. So the Cyclone uh, TR is a dedicated combat vehicle. That's that's the, one of the biggest strengths and the biggest drawbacks. You can't use it for much else other than combat. I mean, there's no not much point in owning a vehicle that has a gun and not really, you know, say you're not really specializing in combat whatsoever. Like you're going to be maybe let's say doing exploration. You do not need a car with a gun on the top. Maybe if you're uh, going down to a planet that has hostile life forms and you want to, you know, have some defense, fair enough, but I recommend using bikes for that because it means you can get out of trouble and you don't have to rely on someone else to use the gun. So the next one on the list is the Cyclone RC, and no, that does not mean remote control, unfortunately, because that would be cool as hell. <laughs> RC car, Cyclone, life-size remote control car from, like, your Carrick, just driving it around on a planet's surface, that'd be hilarious. But yeah, let's see what they say, the developers say on this. For those who like to push the limits of speed, the Cyclone RC features a modified intake system to allow for controlled bursts of speed, as well as tools to customize handling. So, this one's going to handle the best. It is the fastest, because this is your racing bike. This thing is damn quick. I've used it before, and it comes in Ferrari red. It's pretty groovy. One of my buddies used to have one of these. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really, really quick. Like, really, really quick. Um, definitely recommend it for you guys who are in the racing sector. And I know a bunch of you guys out there are. This is what you want to use for your ground scramble races. It's damn fast. And, yeah, no, it, it, it goes like a rocket. But problem is, same is true. If you hit something, it blows up like a rocket. Now, what it has that the others do not have is it has two vehicle fuel tanks. And it needs them because you hit the boost... And you literally have like these huge flames that come bursting out the back and you go real quick in a straight line, which is really cool. 
So yeah, the, the Cyclone uh, RC is definitely the racing vehicle, but as I said, it's it's very specialized. There's not much multi-purpose going on there. So let's move on to the next one, the Cyclone RN. Stay mobile and aware with the Cyclone RN. This light reconnaissance vehicle is the perfect solution for scouting runs, providing fast and detailed scans of terrain as well as beacon placement. So, this vehicle here obviously is a recon vehicle. It's designed for scouting the land. Now this also could be really, really useful in conjunction with a Pioneer, because this is going to give you a detailed scan of the ground layout. And what that can also mean is, say you have a Pioneer and you want to build an outpost somewhere, and you can't really find that even surface of land big enough to fit the Pioneer, or put, put your outpost down properly, send a couple of these RNs out on a scouting operation, and they'll scan the entire area, maybe send them out for a 16-click radius, to just drive around, might take them a little while, but then when they come back, they'll have a detailed scan and a really kick-ass layout, and you might even find some locations you couldn't even have dreamt of that are perfect to land and have, like, you know, an outpost set up, and, yeah, no, like, literally, like, the, the best solution for the job. Now, that's exactly what this uh, vehicle does. It's a really good recon vehicle. Problem is, I wouldn't recommend it for combat recon, simply for the fact of it doesn't have the tanking capabilities that the other option in this role serves as has. It does have the scanning and radar stuff that, you know, like that maybe the other one doesn't have, but at the same time, you can't get out of trouble too quickly with this. If you get stuck somewhere, or you throw a tire, it's game over. You're stranded and there's two of you and now you're both dead and um, it won't go down too well. So let's let's move on to the last one here, and then we will wrap up the positives and the drawbacks of the Tumbrol Cyclones. The Cyclone AA, and definitely my favorite out of the uh, Cyclone variants, a Battlefield Equalizer. The Cyclone Anti-Air comes equipped with a surface-to-air missile and countermeasure package to provide cover for ground troops against airborne targets. Now, this sucker really did change the game. What I mean by that is, it changed the way they thought about things when designing ground vehicles, and that'll come into play a little bit later on with the last ground vehicle we'll talk about. So, the Cyclone AA is basically an anti-air buggy. It's an anti-air car. Now, when, it, when it's released in the uh, more finished stages of the game, it should have a really powerful EMP rocket suite on board, which means not only are you hitting your targets, you know, like you lock on, you fire your missiles, and you hit them and you cause significant damage, but mainly you're gonna fry their systems, and that's really dangerous, especially if you're maybe in a, a saber or something, you're flying down, you're doing strafing runs, all of a sudden you get locked onto, then these missiles hit because they ignore your countermeasures, and boom, you're now out of power and you're a dead stick and you're hurtling towards the ground, and boom, you're gone. You don't have to kill him with the missile payload, you let gravity do that for you. And if you're really lucky, you land on enemy forces. <laughs> but yeah, what, what this one comes with is basically the rocket, um, rocket pod stuff, and the dispersal system, like, you know, the uh, countermeasures. It comes with one, two, B, uh, determined EMP device and two Task Force EM and two Marksman IR missiles. Now this this is a really dangerous vehicle in terms of anti-air capabilities and uh, it's pretty useful. So yeah, definitely my favorite and the most useful. So let's talk about the drawbacks and the positives of all of these. So from the top you've got the standard Cyclone, then you got the uh, TR, the one with the gun, then you got the RC, the racing variant, and then you have the RN, the reconnaissance version, and the anti air version. So, what we're going to discuss here is the what would you really buy these vehicles for and why would you buy them? Is there anything else to get instead that could do the roles better? Now the reason you're going to get a Tumbrel Cyclone is A, they're very rugged. It should be fairly easy to maintain and repair and keep running. Yes, you can hold more than one person in one of them. And also it does carry like, uh, well, sorry, more than two people in one of them. It, they all carry two people minimum, the one with the gun carries a third person. That is very useful. They are modular as well. The back modules on all of these swap out. This thing can be repurposed very efficiently and very quickly and very easily. 
Now, the reasons you wouldn't want to own one of these vehicles is maybe if you have a bike or something and you're just a solo guy, you don't really need a car to be honest, you just need a bike. I know I sound like I'm trying to advertise a mobility for a city or something, but no, I'm, I'm being serious. If you are a single player, you want a bike. Smaller footprint, smaller target, and easier to get around on, and it's going to be more flexible in terms of your maneuverability. A car is very limited, even if it's an all-terrain jeep. It is still very limited, but that said, there is nothing satisfying as jumping a cyclone off of some junk into the distance, and like, you know, maybe jumping a canyon or something is really satisfying. Unfortunately, when you're in a cyclone, you jump a canyon and it goes wrong, you're potentially upside down and either that or dead, so it's not going to end too well. But yeah, these cyclones are very useful. All these ground vehicles, though, I must say, are very risky to use, especially in a game with permadeath. Yeah, they're mandatory in some places, but I wouldn't be too quick to jump in the driver's seat or the passenger's uh, seat should maybe something bad happen. But yeah, these cyclones are super effective. They should be fairly cheap to maintain and use, really cheap to grind up the money for in the game, and yeah, generally good fun to use. Um, drawbacks, they are wheeled vehicles. You throw a wheel, you're done. Easy to shoot down. You know, they're predictable in terms of their movements. They haven't got many axes of movement. And yeah, their, their maneuverability is okay, so you know, they can be basically chased down unfortunately, and they're larger targets. So that is the problem. So that's your positives and your drawbacks of the Cyclone. Let's move on to the next vehicle on the list. So, the ultimate troop transport for now that is, until they bring out a proper troop transport, but this is the Ursa Rover. It does look like it's straight out of Aliens or Mass Effect, and that's not a problem. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. The uh, Ursa Rover is badass. It has six wheel drive. It is incredibly useful, and it can hold a group of people. It can hold quite a few, actually. It's a bit like a clown car, depending on how many people you can just cram into the damn thing. But yeah, it's, it's incredibly useful as an APC because it gets the guys out of gunfire and into a solid frame where they can take cover. It also has a turret there so it can defend itself. Let's read what the developers say. Built by RSI specifically for the Planet Explorer, the Ursa rover offers civilians military-grade all-terrain capabilities and stands as the rugged standard in ground-based scouting, mapping, and discovery applications. The Ursa rover is 8 meters in length, it's 5 meters beam, and it's 3.50 meters in height. Its size obviously is vehicle, cargo capacity of 4 SCU, which is handy, you can haul around maybe some ammunition and whatnot. Uh, maximum crew of 2, that's in the front, but that's not including passengers. It has vehicle radar, vehicle computers, vehicle fuel intake, and vehicle fuel tank. Uh, has no thrusters, it's a car. <laughs> Vehicle power plant, vehicle cooler, vehicle shield generator, and one CF-117 Bulldog laser repeater times two. You got two of these suckers. That's uh, size one, that is, obviously. You have two of these suckers that come off the side that rotates onto the roof to defend you with. It's a remote turret, which is pretty handy. So, positives of the Ursa rover. It's a pretty darn good APC. It's a good way of getting your guys out of maybe a vehicle... Um, to the ground relatively quickly. Shock troops, you have them in the vehicle, it rocks up, lays down suppressive fire, the guys get out the back, and then they assault the position. Drawbacks are it's a wheeled vehicle, yet again, predictable movements, a little bit slow, um, big target, really big target, and not much in the way of shield tank capabilities. Now when they said, yeah, it's military grade, I was honestly expecting a little bit more, but it has the same level shielding as, let's say, a dragonfly or something like that, which is a little disappointing considering its size. I mean, hell, I'm going to go right back again to the X-1 Force as a baseline here. The X-1 Force has two vehicle class shields. That's one more than an Ursa Rover and one more than any of the other vehicles than the last one on the list has in terms of shield tanking capabilities. It's pretty reliable and sturdy in terms of its hull defense, but it's not great. You can kill an Ursa rover by driving it too hard. Trust me, I know this. I've done it. <laughs> um, put all power to the engine and then you, you drive this thing and uh, you go as fast as possible. You hit one too many rocks and it will die. Um, yet again, there you go. Problems. It's quick, fair enough, but when you're hitting rocks and whatnot, the thing is losing HP. In a war zone, you need it to be sturdy and fast. 
you don't want to have to put all your power in the engine to get out of trouble, lose your shields, and then collide with a rock and explode simply because you hit something that was a little bit bigger than a brick. Now, that's one of the major issues I have with the current ground vehicles, but in the future they may be reiterated on and made easier to use in terms of maybe they have they work on their suspension tech and their collision tech to make these vehicles handle a little bit better and be able to handle bumps a little bit better because right now it's kind of terrible. But yeah, the uh, Ursa Rover is a pretty handy vehicle. Positives are it's a combat-esque kind of vehicle, definitely good for military use if you're deciding to go down the mercenary road, a group you are, really good use out of this vehicle. Um, if you're simply using it maybe to shuttle stuff between outposts, still pretty handy, you can hold quite a lot. Really good exploration vehicle as well, you can haul your samples back, you've got an enclosed cab and capsule basically, which means you've could, you can basically be safe from the wildlife outside, and you have guns to defend yourself in in case some wildlife maybe is bigger than your rover, you'll be able to shoot it down. So yeah, there's there's lots of positives. Drawbacks are, it's not as cheap as the others on this list. It's pretty tricky to maintain, I can imagine, because, you know, it, it is going to be a little bit more advanced than a dragonfly in terms of, you know, the components and whatnot. And he did say it has military-grade stuff, so that means the parts might not be easy to replace. But they will last a while, but when they do eventually die out, those components will be hard to get back. You will need to grind reputation for them, or you'll have to maybe put in civilian grade or industrial grade or whatever, just so you can keep it running. So yeah, those, those are the positives and the drawbacks of the Ursa Rover. I really do like the vehicle though, it is kick ass. Now obviously everybody's favorite on the list here is most likely going to be the Tumbrel Nova tank, because it's a cut damn tank. Now, when they decided to set out and make a tank for Star Citizen, they could have gone, right, let's make something the size of an Abrams. They didn't. They kind of went into the Warhammer 40k rulebook and went, oh look, that really, really big tank looks like it'll be a good di idea to build. And they did. They built something that's almost the size of a Warhammer 40k ba Bane Blade tank. This thing is huge. It is absolutely gargantuan. The Tumbrel Nova is a monster in itself, so let's read what they say on this vehicle. Tumbrel's new Nova is a classic battlefield warrior, reimagined for the modern age. This heavy tank offers devastating combination of weaponry to eliminate threats on the ground and in the air. Now you remember what I said on the Tumbrel AA vehicle when they were thinking about the idea of anti-air vehicles. Now when they basically pushed forwards that Tumbrel Nova design, they thought to themselves, right, we can now expand upon this idea, and they did with the tank. The tank has got one of the most advanced ground vehicle anti-air systems you can get, and I did a really in-depth video on the tank uh, a while ago, but I think I'm going to make a new one in the future on this tank just to go into a little bit more details. Or Tonk, as it was called when it first came out. The guy tried to pronounce the word tank. He tried. <laughs> oh boy, did he try. But... Tonk, Tonk sounds pretty good to me, personally. Yeah, the, the, the Tonk is a very useful vehicle. I mean, the guy has an amazing voice. If you're watching this dude, you rock. <laughs> Alright, so let's get into its size. It's got a length of 16 meters. Bum, bum, bum. It's got a beam of 7 meters and a height of 5 meters. Its size is vehicle. It's got a maximum crew of 3. A minimum crew of... Persons not listed just says persons. <laughs> I'm guessing you know just wh whoever's around basically <laughs> um, It has a small radar and a medium computer now these where the components start to get pretty big obviously it's got well, for some reason, it's got no fuel intakes and no fuel tank as listed. It's got no thrusters, obviously. It's a damn tank. It's got a small power plant. It's got two small coolers. And it has a small shield generator. This is the toughest and most rugged vehicle on this list, people. It's a monster. It's weapons. It has two, size two to be determined, energy repeaters. And four to be determined, ballistic cannon. So it has a size four ballistic cannon as well as two size two energy repeaters it has a size four goddamn ballistic cannon i mean that's insane well it, it is a tank but goddamn <laughs> it put a hole in outpost and no, like no problems whatsoever hell you put a like a freaking ursa rover like just blow it off the planet's surface boom gone 
It also has two size two missile to be determined. Now, what's important about that is they were running with the idea that this thing would have energy-based missiles, which is pretty interesting if you think about it. And the missiles run off of reactor power instead of actually having like an, a sort of like an ammunition counter, which was pretty interesting. So let's let's cover the positives and the drawbacks of the tank. Positives. It's a goddamn tank. I mean, if you're the guy who owns that outpost and you have all these little dragonflies coming towards you, you just open the garage door and then the tank rolls out and you'll see these little dragonflies just turn around and fly the other way and be like, nah, yeah, no, he's got a tank. <laughs> I mean, it's a goddamn tank. It's a damn tank. Or tonk as they call it in France. <laughs> it's, a mean, it's a mean machine. It's a man-eater. This thing's a beast. Um... Really, really, really good for offensive and defensive capabilities. You can literally run your marines in behind the tank. Just walk them in behind the tank. You don't need an Ursa rover. Just send the tank in with a bunch of guys stood behind it. And this thing will eat through basic planetary defenses. This thing is a monster. Landed ships will be just gone in no time. Even ships that are flying, this thing is a beast against. In its history, this thing was able to take out quite a few targets and was able to hold like, hold its own in combat against, obviously, greater odds. Um, in the Tavaran War, this tank played a huge role. So yeah, the, the, the tank is an absolute monster. Pos obviously, it's, it's got a few positives as a tank in a combat role. Obviously, its drawbacks are not exactly useful in cases of things like touring. You know, you can't drive along... Well, you can drive along the beach in a tank, but most people think you're trying to liberate a country or maybe, you know, <laughs> do a whole beach landing type deal. That's a problem. <laughs> Exploring. You could explore with a tank, but I believe that's called invasion. <laughs> so... Obviously, the positives and the drawbacks. So, drawbacks, there are quite a few. I'm gonna be honest with you now. The tank is going to be really, really, really difficult to repair and get parts for, and it's going to be expensive as all hell to run. It's the most expensive vehicle on this entire list to use. The ammunition is going to cost plenty. It's it's going to need a lot of repairs and all this type of stuff. It's going to be slow. It's going to be a massive target. But yet again, it is a tank. You know, it, it can hold its own to an extent, but it is a huge target really really big and as they say with tanks this is another one of the drawbacks you can't just use one or two if you want to be effective you need to use at least three or four of these things and use them in sort of like an armored spearhead kind of technique because when you're going to use tanks there's going to be a time where you're maybe in a large scale ground combat kind of scenario which i will be covering in my next video watch out for that one which will be starsis and war zones where i'll be talking in depth about ground warfare and what you can expect to happen and that type of stuff but yeah the positives and the drawbacks positives are it's a tank it's really useful to have especially if you're in a mercenary group you may not have these huge ground combat scenarios, but if you're able to just quickly deploy a tank and the enemy doesn't have anything that can match that, you automatically win. Really fantastic for destroying ground structures and things like that. So yeah, the, the tank is the cheap alternative to a bomber or something like that. You literally drive up and destroy the buildings manually rather than drop bombs, which are really expensive and require a ship to do so. So yeah, the, the tank is pretty useful in that regard. But the drawbacks are its maintenance and repairs are going to be a nightmare. So I hope that covers the basics on these ground vehicles. This is a very quick wrap-up. Well, quick in uh, demo man language is probably almost an hour. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, a wrap-up that covers all the bases for these ground vehicles. And I'd really like to know what you guys think of each one of the vehicles I listed here in this video. Alternate uses for said vehicles. Um, ideas behind each vehicle, like maybe why you bought them, what your uses are. Maybe you thought outside the box. Maybe you thought, you know what, I'm going to buy a tank and I'm going to use it to sell Big Bennies. I'm going to fire the Big Bennies noodles right out the cannon <laughs> into people's homes forcefully and build them. <laughs> Don't like noodles? Too bad. Douche gone. <laughs> oh, but yeah, like that. <laughs> oh man, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. But yeah, I would love to know what uses you would like to uh, that you've decided to come up with for th these vehicles. So yeah, I'm going to be making a Star Citizen Warzone video. It is the one that I'm working on right now, 
And I want to make a quick wrap up cover up of all these ground vehicles and get the baseline stuff talked about before I go more depth in the next video. The, more, the next video is going to be a big one and I'm going to be talking for quite a while about ground warfare. We'll be covering everything from marine combat to titan suits to frickin tank warfare, anti-air capabilities, things to expect, changes in planetary atmosphere such as low gravity, high gravity, standard gravity, you got frickin planets with atmospheres, no atmospheres, toxic atmospheres, all this stuff to take into account. You know what I mean? Like adverse weather conditions, you name it. I'm going to be talking about it. So yeah, that's in the next video. So watch out for that one. And, and um, I also want to just say thank you to all of you. Thank you so much for watching my videos, coming back to watch and subscribing. If you do want to support the channel, I know I'm ranting on about this every video now, but it is literally what keeps this channel running. Um, is the Patreon. If you would like to support me on Patreon, go right ahead. There's a link in the description below where you can check out my Patreon page and uh, support the channel directly. I am going to be setting up a Discord for the Patreon channel where um, it's specifically for Patreon users to get in touch with me and whatnot where we can talk in voice comms and stuff and chat in the text channel. So yeah, um, thank you guys yet again so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me. You guys are amazing. If you haven't noticed, I sound a little under the weather. It's because I am. I am recovering from a uh, injury that happened um, a little while ago. But yeah, I'm I'm getting better. But um, you know, I'm also really under the weather right now with uh, flu. You could say I got the man flu and I got it bad. <laughs> well, that's not gonna stop me from making a video. So I just want to say thank you to all of you to coming back and watching my videos and subscribing and talking to me in the comments. I love you all for it. It really does go a tremendously long way, like more more than most people think. It it really does help because. You know, talking to you guys, it gives me a way to reach out and really understand what you guys want to see more of and what you care about and ideas for videos and whatnot. So if you have any ideas, anything at all, just please let me know in the comments below and I will get right on it and we'll, uh, like, you know, we talk about it and uh, I'll let you know if I've done it already or if I'm about to do it. So first, I would like to quickly say thank you to all my Patreons. So Adrian Miller, Andrew Burton, Bill Briant. Brandon Kelly, Brandon Manuel, David Toombs, Izum, Izumi, Izum, I'm pronouncing it wrong again, I know I am, god damn it, I am so sorry dude, I know, I know, I've tried, okay, I'm gonna get it right, third time is the charm, next video you watch, I'll get it right, I also like to say thank you to Samuel Pitt, Tom Tabola, and Yellow, all of you, thank you so goddamn much, you guys are the best, thank you. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. And uh, unless I transform into some kind of mutant alien hybrid because of this man flu, which would really, really suck. Unless I grew extra arms, and then I'll be able to get the work done in half the time. <laughs> Alright, so you know the drill, Commanders. Fly safe, and I'll see you in the verse. If you're looking for a Bar Citizen event, why not check out Bar Citizen San Antonio, Texas? That's right, there's a Bar Citizen event for you to go to. Check out the description for all the relevant information, such as a map, a link to their Discord, and all that good stuff. And I cannot recommend it enough. It's full of the nicest individuals you could possibly hope to meet, all itching to talk about Star Citizen and sci-fi and what the hell ever. So why don't you jump on down there and say hello to some of the guys, and I hope you have a wonderful and amazing time.